Illinois handed Maryland football their second loss in a row on Saturday. How concerned is head coach Mike Loxley as he heads into the bye week? Maryland field hockey notched an impressive top 10 win on the road, and volleyball continues to struggle. All that and more coming up on the left bench. You know, the adversity that we find ourselves in today, uh, we put ourselves there. So the only people that can get us out of it is us. Yeah, we're trying to find this like in between and, and we haven't been able to find it lately. Hello everyone and welcome into the Left Bench brought to you by Terrapin Sports Central. I'm Nathan Schwartz, joined alongside Jonas Evans and Jonas. Maryland football is heading into its bye week with some major question marks. Yeah, Nate, uh, this team was undefeated just two weeks ago and they haven't been able to get the job done against Illinois or Ohio State. And more recently, Illinois may have entered the game as the Big Ten's third ranked offense, but on Saturday, it was Maryland's defense that couldn't keep up. Illinois QB Luke Altmaier put his team on the scoreboard first with this 44-yard heave to Pat Bryan for the touchdown, but the Terps came storming back with two of their own, including this catch from linebacker Sean Greeley, his second touchdown as a fullback this season. But Maryland wasn't able to hold on to its lead for much longer. Late in the first half, Illinois took advantage of some costly Maryland penalties to find the end zone and tie the game at 14. The Fighting Illini took an early lead in the second half, but an Antoine Littleton touchdown cut it to three. Late in the fourth quarter, Jack Howes nailed his kick from 40 yards out to tie the game at 24. But the Terps left 90 seconds on the clock, and that was enough for Illinois. Altmaier led his offense in a field goal range in just three plays, and Caleb Griffin's 43-yard kick sailed through the uprights as the Terps lose on the final play, 27-24. Here's head coach Mike Loxley after the loss. I'm disappointed in the things we didn't do, not as much as what Illinois did, but the things we didn't do, you know, to, to turn it over there before the half and you have a chance to go up 21 to whatever, seven. You know, we always fight to get what we call that two-score swing between the halves. This game was close the whole way through, but there were a couple of key turning points for Maryland. I took a look at what those were and how the team is responding as they head into the bye. Maryland football battled it out with Illinois in what many thought would be a surefire win for the Terps. Well, that didn't happen. The Fighting Illini hit a game-winning field goal as time expired, stunning the Terps. Two weeks ago, Maryland football was 5-0 and seemed ready to hang with the big boys in the Big Ten. But now after last week's loss to Ohio State and this week's shocking loss to Illinois, the Terps have a lot of reflection to do as they head into the bye week. I've got to have our team prepared to, to go play. Uh, we, we don't make excuses. Uh, we did not play to our standard, and it's frustrating to watch because I still have a lot of faith and belief in this team. Well, you know, we just got to get back to work. Good thing with us, you know, time is on our side with this bye week, so we have time to really look within um, and really get right. But, uh, you know, we're going to get it fixed. I believe in us. Reflection is always key after a loss. And looking back on how Maryland lost this game, two moments stand out. Maryland had a chance to go up by two scores before half until a Caden Prather fumble gave the Illini the ball. And then on Maryland's last offensive possession, on third and six, Loxley and Josh Gaddis decided to run, which went nowhere, forcing Maryland to settle for three. I said, when we go to third medium, we have calls on both sides of the thing. Third medium runs, third medium pass. We made the decision to run, and uh, it, it didn't work. So that goes back to, to myself as the leader. Um, you know, I got to give us a better play or, or put us in a better position in that situation. Maryland had chances to put the game away, which makes the loss sting even more. But for Hippolyte, He's staying positive as the team moves forward. Uh, you know, what I say to my teammates um, and, you know, the guys that I'm with, you got to keep the head up. You got to keep your chin high. Um, you know, this is a game of football. Like, you're going to make mistakes. You're not going to be perfect all game. Uh, you got to take some losses to win in the end. So, you know, it's unfortunate that we got to go through that. But, you know, it's just, it's, it's just, you know, the plan for us this season. For Terrapin Sports Central, I'm Nathan Schwartz. Great job by me on that package. And to help us break down Maryland's loss to Illinois, we decided to not only bring Brandon Schwartzberg on, but also his partner in covering the team for the Diamondback, Taylor Lyons. Gentlemen, thanks for being here. Thanks for having us on. Yep, thanks for having me. So Taylor, Brandon, I'm sure a lot of Terps fans were shocked by that Illinois result. How do you explain what happened on Saturday? Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with coaching, honestly. I'll start just 
before halftime, Mike Loxley calls that timeout when Illinois was lining up to kick a field goal. After the timeout, the Illini come back out, going, going for it on fourth down. They get the touchdown. That was a big momentum swing before halftime. And then kind of at the end of the game, there were a few questionable play calls down the stretch on their final drive. I know Taylor just had a story out on that if you want to expand. Yeah, so going off of Brandon, the uh, you know Maryland, Mike Loxley, Josh Gaddis ran the ball on third and six, kind of set up the, the uh, Jack Howes 48-yard field goal, seemingly kind of playing for a tie, playing to get to overtime. Loxley said he trusted his defense to get a stop there. Defense did not get a stop, gave it back to Illinois with over a minute to go. I think they had a couple timeouts as well, and they get down in field goal range pretty easily. So I know you were very specific asking about those running plays uh, to Coach Mike Loxley. What did you kind of think his reaction was to uh, those play calls? Did you think he was satisfied with the run plays and it just didn't work out, or do you think he was frustrated as yeah, well? Yeah, so he said they have play calls. They have runs designed for third and medium. Um, I'm sure, you know, obviously a pass is probably a higher percentage play in that situation, but they had faith in the, uh, you know, in the run and Antoine Littleton, and instead of gaining six, they lost one and settled for the field goal. Certainly an interesting call for sure. And guys, this team had a, a bit of a rough start, but you know, they were ultimately 5-0 and until this two-week stretch, now 5-2 and going into the bye. Is it time to hit the panic button for the Terps? I don't think it's time to hit the panic button yet, although that could change in two weeks. They have the bye now, as you mentioned. I think it's a very, it's a good reset for them. They've had a couple of losses, get, get back regrouped. But then if they lose to Northwestern, I think then it's time to hit the panic button because the, the idea for them, the next step for them this year is, is to be one of those big three, Ohio State, Michigan, and Penn State. They didn't beat Ohio State, so that leaves two left. But even beyond that, if they really lose to Northwestern after losing to Illinois, those are going to be two tough losses that I don't think they can overcome. Yeah, they still have two more chances for that big win, like Brandon mentioned, against Penn State and Michigan coming up uh, later this month and next month. And as long as they don't lose to Nebraska, Rutgers, Northwestern, a team like that, finish 8-4, and 9-3 and three range, I don't think that panic button's coming out yet. And guys, Tulia Tugavailoa, he ranks second in the Big Ten in passing yards, but the offense has definitely had some consistency issues recently, especially obviously with Illinois. How would you kind of evaluate where the quarterback is at right now and also compared to last year? I think he's had an up and down season. Um, I think going into the season, you kind of wanted him to grow because he's been here for so long. He, he's got all the record books you could have. You want him to grow, kind of have those great performances in those big games against the Ohio States. And he got outplayed by Kyle McCord, a guy making his first – his first year as a starter and I think that was kind of a bad sign for him but as you mentioned he has had good stats he's thrown the deep ball better and I, I just think that if he can continue to do that and get one of those signature wins down the stretch I think that's really going to define a season. Yeah like Brandon said that improved deep ball has been really big for Talia in this offense another thing with Tugavalo has been escaping pressure uh, he's been he's been pressured this season on I think 24 or 25 percent of his dropbacks, but he's only been sacked on about six percent of them. That's down from about 25, 26 percent last year. So he's really improved in that regard, escaping pressure, leaving the pocket when the play collapses, and finding someone downfield. Uh, I was just going to say, is there something maybe that Tully is doing uh, weaker? You're saying he's more comfortable in the pocket, but maybe yeah. something that he's not as strong this yeah. season. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of like what Brandon said, the up and downs. He's done a bit to kind of level that out. The highs haven't been as high, the lows haven't been as low. Um, you know, but I, I think it's kind of what you expect in a fourth, fifth-year quarterback is kind of finding that steady consistency towards the end of the season that they're going to need to knock off, like we said, Michigan or Penn State. All right, so last one for you guys. Brandon, when we had our debate, first show of the year, you were so adamant that this team could get to nine wins. Now that we're going into the bye week, we're seven weeks in, do you still think they can get to nine? And Taylor, after Brandon goes, I want to hear your win prediction as well. All right, so they've got five wins now. They've got Northwestern, Penn State, Michigan, Rutgers, and Nebraska. So they need to win four of those. You think they're not winning both, if any, of Michigan or Penn State. So I don't think they're going to get to nine wins. They still can, but the possibility has definitely decreased. So you were wrong, <laughs> and I was right. Well, we don't know yet. I could be right. We'll see. I, okay. But, but, yeah, you're admitting that you're, you had sort of a bad take. Not yet. All right. Taylor, what about you? Yeah, to get to nine wins, they're going to have to knock off one of those big two teams who, uh, you know, Penn State, outside of the COVID year, they haven't beaten since, I think, 2015. Michigan, similar, similar thing there. Um, and that also assumes they don't lose to any of Nebraska, Rutgers, or Northwestern, which, you know, we didn't think losing to Illinois was possible. And now, you know, look at that. So, I think nine wins is a little unlikely. That was probably a, I, I would I would have agreed with you in the preseason, um, but now after last week, I think eight and four is probably more realistic. 
All right, well, that's all that we're going to have time for Taylor and Brandon right now, but they'll be back later in the show for even more Maryland football. Guys, thanks for joining us. Yep. Thanks yep. for having me. Be sure to check out both Taylor and Brandon's coverage of Maryland football at dbknews.com. You can find both on X at Taylor J. Lyons and B. Schwartzberg 03. Now let's shift from football to men's soccer, where Sasso Shrovsky's squad was desperate to get a point in the standings, and they got it. Maryland took the lead just 90 seconds in thanks to this insane bar down goal off the head of Luke Van Hooklum and didn't stop there. Max Riley found the back of the net off a deflection from Michigan State goalie Zach Kelly, 2-0 Terps. Michigan State didn't let the early deficit get to them though, coming back ready to go in the second half. Jake Spadafora scored the first Spartan goal off of one touch just inside the box and in the 77th minute, Jonathan Stout notched the equalizer, tying the match at two. Both teams failed to get the go-ahead goal, ending the match in a draw. But for Maryland, it's a result that keeps its hopes for a Big Ten tournament appearance alive. We've got a lot more games to recap, so after the break, we'll take a look at all the other Terps that hit the road this weekend. And later, TSC's Ryan Martin will join, join us to preview Maryland volleyball's potential in the postseason. Don't go anywhere. I tell my son, I love you every single day. I love you. Oh. And my dad has never said that to me. Not because he doesn't love me, but because culturally it wasn't comfortable for him. Now that he's a grandfather, he says, I love you to my son every time he sees him. My advice to all the fathers out there, forget the cultural restrictions. They grow up way too fast for you to waste even a single precious moment. Hey Mason. Hey Mason. Got a new house. It's looking pretty cool so far. A place that I call home. I'm teaching Louise how to cook some lasagna. It only takes a spark to make a fire start. Thank you. Let's study, please. I think I finally found a place to make my own. A place that I call home. This place that I call home. Welcome back, everyone, to the Left Bench, brought to you by Terry Flynn Sports Central. I'm Nathan Schwartz. That's Jonas Evans. And Jonas, how about this Maryland field hockey team? They just keep on winning. Yeah, haven't lost a game in the month of October. They're really hitting their stride at the perfect time. Maryland field hockey hasn't lost Ohio State since joining the Big Ten, winning all 11 head-to-heads since 2014. The Terps are in Columbus on Sunday, hungry for another win from the opening whistle. In the fourth minute, Hannah Boss found Sammy Popper right in front of the Buckeyes' goal, 1-0 Terps. Later in the second quarter, the Buckeyes had their best chance yet, when an Anne-Marie Krebs shot forced this incredible save from Alyssa Klobasco. And Maryland's lead wouldn't last much longer. Ohio State finally broke through in the third quarter with this perfectly executed counterattack, capped off by a Halley Brost goal to tie it. But the Terps were determined. Less than 10 minutes later, a series of perfect passes led to this Macy Bradford tap-in goal that gave Maryland the lead, and this time the Buckeyes had no response. The Terps get it done on the road, 2-1. Maryland women's soccer traveled to Iowa City on Sunday trying to win their first match since September 10th, but this one was never close. Iowa wasted no time getting on the board with El Otto striking first in the fourth minute. The Hawkeyes were relentless up front, especially in the first half, as two more goals put them up 3-0 at the break. The Hawkeyes kept their foot on the gas with Maryland's inability to create shots as a penalty goal from Josie Durr and a long-range strike from Sophia Bush capped off the 5-0 Hawkeye win. The game marked the second time this season Maryland has lost by five goals. Maryland Volleyball was in Madison on Sunday to face its toughest opponent of the season, the number one ranked Wisconsin Badgers. Early on, the Badgers turned defense into offense with some great passing and a killer finish from Sophia Franklin as Wisconsin ran away with the first set, 25-15. The Badgers continued to punch holes in the Terps' defense in the second set, ending it on a 9-1 run. That gave Wisconsin the set, 25-12, to 
with no sign of an upset. The Terps did make a push in the third, fueled by some great team defense from Sidney Dollar and Eva Rohrbach. Maryland was on the offensive too, using 6'5 Anastasia Russ to put some pressure at Wisconsin at the net. The number one ranked Badgers have some height of their own, to the tune of 6'9 Anna Smrek, who tallied 11 total kills as she powered her team to the 25-16 third set win. The Badgers sweep the Terps 3-0, Maryland's third loss in a row. Here's head coach Adam Hughes after the game. I think the big message to the group was that we want to make sure, I mean, there was things within the match that we have control over that I didn't think we did a great job in that area. You know, attack errors, uh, probably, probably the biggest one. But it's a hard situation. You're trying to find this balance of staying aggressive. Um, you know, you're trying to find this position where you're trying to power through a little bit. And, you know, we can't find this, like, good medium ground. So it's, it seems like it's all or nothing at times. Despite the loss to Wisconsin, Hughes' squad still has a chance to make a run for the NCAA tournament, something they haven't done in recent years. Ryan Martin is in Studio B to break down the path Maryland needs to take in order to get there. Ryan? Yeah, guys, the Badgers are the number one team in the country, and a loss doesn't help Maryland's cause. But there's still a shot at some NCAA tournament hopes. Maryland volleyball is nearing the halfway mark of conference play, being 10 games into a 22-game slate. And for years, the main goal for Adam Hughes and company has been a return to that NCAA tournament. The Terps are still in search of their first tournament appearance since 2005. But is it too late for, the, for Maryland this season? Well, not necessarily. Maryland has finished every season with, with a losing conference record since joining the Big Ten. Yikes. But with a 3-5 and five record, the Terps have to turn things around in order to get to 500. And history shows getting to 500 might be all that it takes. 14 out of 15 teams to finish with a 500 or better conference record in the Big Ten over the last two seasons have earned a tournament berth. Guys, a lot of check marks there. So let's take a look at what Maryland Volleyball has done recently and what they'll have to do to reach a 500 mark and a potential bid. The highlight of the season was Maryland's upset win over number 16 Minnesota. The Terps came out on top in a five-set thriller and boasted a 3-2 and two Big Ten record after the match. But since, Maryland has lost three straight, dropping to a 3-5 and five conference record. In order to get to 500, Maryland will have to go 7-5 and five the rest of the way out. And there are a few key matchups to prioritize. Iowa, Rutgers, and Michigan. Those three teams have gone a combined 2-22 and 22 in the Big Ten this year. The Terps would need to grab a few more wins, but all three matches would catapult Maryland into better position and reach that 500 mark. But more importantly, a potential tournament bid. Guys, Maryland will start their push for playoff positioning this Friday against Illinois, and a win would put the Terps in a great position. Back to you guys. Thanks, Ryan. And Jonas, it would really be nice to see Adam Hughes and this team get into postseason play. This program has been on the rise for a couple years, so to see it all pay off would be an amazing sight. Yeah, and Ryan did the math for us, right? they got to get seven wins, five losses. It's interesting. It's really, I think it's going to be about taking care of business for them. They have a few weak teams to face. Are they going to be able to put together those wins? Consistency has been kind of an issue for this team. What do you think? Can they do I'm it? I'm going to say now I think they can do it. All right, we'll I, see. We will see. Now stay right here because when we come back, Brandon Schwartzberg and Taylor Lyons will be back with us in a new location to play a game of hot takes about Maryland football. And of course, we'll crown our Pro Terp, Terp of the Week, and Top 5 Plays. Don't go anywhere. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. There are so many rewards in life. You coming into our home was one of the greatest rewards we could have ever had. You know, it took 20 years, and I got my third child, who was 17 at the time. It's so cool to watch the adult that you've become, and you really have done as much for us as you think we've done for you.
Welcome back to The Left Bench, brought to you by Terrapin Sports Central. I'm Nathan Schwartz with Jonas Evans, Brandon Schwartzberg, and Taylor Lyons here in Studio B as we're bringing back a fan favorite. And that's a game that we haven't played in about two years. Not really sure why, because it's a fun one. It's a game of hot takes. Our producers wrote four hot takes about Maryland football on these pieces of paper. And we're going to decide if we agree on if they're really hot takes or not. Let's get started. Nate, you've got our first one. Yeah, sure do. All right. Right off the bat, we got a good one. Talia Tungavailoa is the best quarterback in the Big Ten. I'm going to start with this. I don't think so. I mean, you have J.J. McCarthy, Drew Aller. I think you could even throw Kyle McCord in there in that conversation as well. Talia's definitely in the top three or four, but I don't think he's in the top one. Yeah, I agree with you. I think you can de it's clearly obvious that J.J. McCarthy is number one. I think we can all agree with that. And then the conversation between Drew Aller, Kyle McCord, and Talia, I think it's close, but I would have to agree with you. I think he's a slot below those, especially because he got outplayed by Colin right. McCord, and I think that really hurts his case. And look, guys, I think a lot of Terps fans are probably saying Talia doesn't get enough big games, doesn't get to prove himself, but I think if he was playing in those big stadiums week after week, I don't think his stats would even look as good as they do now. So I'm going to unfortunately have to agree with you as well. I agree with you guys. Talk about always taking a big step forward this year, but I still think best in the Big Ten is a little bit of a stretch. I would put him in that top three category with McCarthy and Howard. Now, now, if he is able to perform in these big games, you know, you just mentioned mm -hmm, yeah. the big stadiums and all that, but, you know, he's, he's had games against Michigan and Iowa and Penn State and Ohio State throughout his four-year tenure with Maryland. It doesn't seem to really perform well in any of those games. If he's able to perform in those games, is this a different conversation right now? I think so. I think what I'm looking for personally is a clean sheet in the turnover department because he's put up the yards, he's put up the touchdowns, but he's really struggled to have a turnover-free game against those quality defenses, the best in the Big Ten. And I think for him to get to the top of the conversation, even with J.J. McCarthy, he absolutely has to be turnover-free against uh, Michigan and Penn State. And he'll have a chance to prove it later on this year when McCarthy and Aller come to College Park. He'll have the opportunity to go up against those guys head-to-head. -head. So we'll see if Talia, like you said, the bright lights, the big stage, and see if he can handle when they, when they come. All right, I've got our second take here. Would Maryland win the Big Ten West if they were in the division? I'm going to actually agree with this one. I think with this season, it might be a little more question marks. But look, I, they Michigan and Ohio State is very different from Iowa and Wisconsin. Those are two teams that Maryland on a, the right day, maybe at home, they could maybe get it done. So I'm actually going to say they could do it. And I agree with you. I was really good this year, but if Maryland could avoid the Penn States, Michigan, Ohio State on their schedule every year and go up, you know, it's Iowa, Wisconsin, those types of teams, I think they, they could rattle off a 9-3, 10-2, 11-1 type of year. So I, I, I agree with you that they could win the Big Ten West. I think we're going to have our first disagreement here. I'm going to say no, they would not win the Big Ten West if they win that division. I'm going to take you back the last couple of years and tell you why. 2021, get blown out by Iowa at home. Um, last year, you go to Wisconsin and you lose. This year, you lose to Illinois at home. Last year, you lose to Purdue at home. That's four losses in the Big Ten West right there in the last two years. And, of course, last year, you remember the Northwestern game at home. That only took Roman Hemby going 75 yards with a couple minutes left to seal that win. So even though the Big Ten West is definitely the inferior division, I think Maryland's struggles against them in the last couple years are telling me that they just wouldn't be able to get it done. Nate, I'm going to have to side with you. I do not think they would be better than Iowa in that Big Ten West. I think their defense is incredible. I think Talia, we saw how much he struggled when they came here for the blackout game. I think it'd be even worse, honestly. This year, their defense is incredible, as it always is. And I just think that they'd be at the top of the Big Ten West. They wouldn't have to compete with the Big Three in the East. But I, I can't crown them above Iowa. And even, I mean, Wisconsin, they've had struggles with them also. Look, guy, I understand that, right? But let's look at what they did against Michigan, against Ohio State in these recent years with Tolia, right? They've, they've been really good when they face the top teams in their division. I, I, I get the point. They, they haven't been good in Iowa. They haven't been good in Wisconsin. But if they went into those games knowing how important it would be that if they win this game, they can possibly win the division, I think they'd play much higher to their standard the way they do against Mi Michigan and Ohio State because those teams are in there. I mean, don't get me wrong, I think they'd be a lot more competitive for buying for a trip to Indy if they were in the Big Ten West because you, have, you don't have to deal with who we've talked about already, but they haven't proven to me that they can beat the top teams that are in that division right now, so I'm going to stick with my side of the argument. All right, I have our third take, our third hot take. Even with back-to-back -back losses, Maryland should be ranked in the top 25. I don't think any of us are going to agree with this. I think maybe if you asked me two weeks ago, maybe even a week ago, you could say yes. 
Um, but now with two losses, there's only two teams with two losses ranked in the top 25 this week. I don't think Maryland's one of them. No, I mean, I was on the field watching the Illinois game. That was not a top 25 team, plain and simple. I think, like you said a few weeks ago, I actually would have argued they probably should have been ranked at the time, and even after the Ohio State game, possibly. But that's just a loss you can't take. You're not one of the better teams in the country if you play a game like that. Yeah, I mean, there was a reason they weren't ranked going into that Ohio State game, then they lose to Ohio State. You know they're not going to be ranked moving forward unless they were to beat Penn State at home and then maybe even then they might not be ranked. And now, after this loss to Illinois, there's just no chance they're ranked at any point this season, in my opinion. I think that the only chance they have is to beat one of Penn State or Michigan. I, I think that, obviously, they're not going to get ranked without that. The loss to Illinois extremely hurt them, so I think that they may have to win both, if I'm being honest, because, as Taylor said, there's only two teams right now in the top 25 with two losses, and so they can't afford to have another loss against any of the, their other opponents. I mean, we saw what happened against Illinois, so we can't go for certain that they're going to go undefeated. Now, follow up for everybody. If Maryland were somehow able to beat both Penn State and Michigan, how high would they be up in these rankings? By the end of the year, so that means a, you know, likely a 10-2 and two finish. I think that could have them in the top 15, top 20, maybe even higher in the top 10 with those quality wins. Nate, I'll say we're going to say yes to all of these things if they win those games. because I, I, And that's actually a point I wanted to make. They're going to be very determining of how we think of this team, how we think of Coach Locks, how we think of Tolia, how we think of the team as a whole are those games. If they can get one of those wins, it'll prove that they do have what it takes, 60 minutes of great football. So I think a lot of things could change if they win one of those. I definitely think they could get into the top 15. It's just, will they? Yeah, I, I think there's a chance. But again, that's banking on them not losing to any of their other opponents on the schedule. Plus also beating the, the two Giants that they have struggled to do so since they joined the Big Ten. And so I think the ceiling would probably be top 15. I don't know if they get into the top 10. I think that's a little bit of a stretch, but top 15 for sure. All right, Brandon, final one. Here's one. Michael Axley will win Big Ten Coach of the Year. Ooh. I personally will disagree with that. I think that had he been Ohio State, definitely he had to be in Illinois. I think that had he been Ohio State, he could definitely be in the conversation. But you look at Penn State, James Franklin. You look at Brian Day at Ohio State. Those coaches right now have to be the favorite for the conversation. Now, if Michael Axley, as we said, throughout this whole discussion. If they beat one of or the two Giants that they have left on the schedule, then it's a conversation, but right now I don't think it is. Yeah, I think this Illinois loss is just gonna be too big of a step to come back from. You also have Kirk Ferentz out there in Iowa City making a case for Big Ten Coach of the Year, so I don't, I don't really think this is up for any debate. Well, I'll say this. I, I think that it's gonna be very determinant, again, on those games that we talked about, but I'll say what I've noticed is I, I just don't see a difference between this team and last year's team, and to me, I think that was Coach Loxley's responsibility in the offseason is what can he pull from this roster? How can he make them better? And how can he make them compete against the Big Ten teams? And to me, I just think that they've kind of gone flat, and I don't think they've really kind of pushed farther than what they had last year. Yeah, up to two weeks ago, it did seem like they were going to be that team that, like, like you talked about, that avoids mistakes, that avoids the big letdown loss, and keeps it close against those top teams in the conference. The past two weeks just haven't shown that. Um, and I think, you know, perhaps a 9 3 finish could have gotten them that Coach of the Year award, even if they didn't beat any of the top three because that would have been you know a two-win improvement from the year prior but now with back-to-back -back losses including Illinois um, it would you know it, it would take a lot to get that award. A clean sweep to end our fourth and final hot take. A lot of pessimism. Of this segment. Huh? A lot of pessimism you know and I think it's warranted after I, I, I think so. I, I think rather so well. Illinois at home but you know that's going to be all the time we've got with Brandon and Taylor today. Guys thanks for spending so much time with us today. Thanks for having me on. Yep thanks for having me. All right, it's time to hand out some awards, starting with our Terp of the Week. After her clutch goal this weekend, how could we not give it to Macy Bradford? Bradford was crucial in field hockey's win at Ohio State on Sunday, scoring a late goal in the fourth quarter that won it for the Terps. Sunday's game winner was Bradford's seventh goal so far as the freshman continues to impress in her first season. Congrats to Macy for being crowned our Terp of the Week. Former Terp Melo Trimble has been balling overseas in the VTB United League. After an impressive performance over the weekend, he's this week's pro Terp. Trimble's CSKA Moscow faced Parma on Sunday, and the former Maryland guard showed out. Trimble came off the bench for Moscow, and in just 15 minutes played, he scored 17 points, the third highest total from any player on the night. And more importantly, Melo got it done in crunch time. Down one with only eight seconds left in the game, Trimble stepped up to the line and sunk two clutch free throws. Parma had no response, and Moscow won it 77-76. to 76. 
Congrats to Mello for being our pro turf this week. All right, Jonas, top five time. Let's see who showed out this weekend. All right, here at number five is one that I saw right in person. Sean Greeley with the first touchdown of the game for the Terps, usually playing linebacker, but he got it at fullback, and it's his second touchdown of the season. What a great moment there. Now let's go up to Columbus, where Sammy Popper gets the Terps on the board just a few minutes into this one, going in through traffic, lifts it over the leg pad of the Buckeye goalie. All right, we've got Tolia Tagavailo with the no-look pass. Nate, I know we have a lot of slow-mos here because we got to see that again. He is looking nowhere close to the receiver, fakes out the entire defense. No one had any idea where that ball was going. Now let's go to East Lansing for number two. It's Luke Van Hooklem, one of the star freshmen on Sasso Slavsky's squad. Header, bar down to give Maryland a lead just 90 seconds in. All right, and at number one, we've got Jayshon Jones throwing the ball and Tolia catching it. A little trick play there, and the Terps, just great to see there. Tolia Tagovailoa usually throwing the ball, but he's got hands too, and Jayshon with the perfect pass as well, Nate. Now, if you go back to 2018, Jayshon Jones' first game as a Terp, he threw a touchdown pass. When I saw that trick play on the sidelines the other day, that was the first thing I thought of. It's, it's great to see that you have so much Maryland knowledge. Uh, well, that does it for this edition of The Left Bed. Big thanks to Ryan, Brandon, and Taylor for joining us. Our show will be back in a week's time with Matthew Noose and Alexa Wooten behind the desk. Until then, keep up with all of TSC's coverage on X, Instagram, YouTube, and online at TerraFrenchSportsCentral.com. We'll see you next time.